Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming um, to, today's, uh, to today's session. Uh, my name is Gib Clark. I am the uh, Senior Program Associate with the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program. And um, uh, on behalf of our director, Jeff DeBelco, who unfortunately is unable to be here today, I want to welcome you to the Wilson Center. Uh, for those of you who have not been here before, just a quick word about the center before we get started. Uh, the Wilson Center is the uh, official living memorial to our, our nation's 29th president. Um, uh, he was our only president with a PhD, so the idea is to bring the world of policy with the world of ideas. And so that's what our program and the other 20 programs here at the center aims to do in, in events such as this. Uh, our program, the Environmental Change and Security Program, looks at uh, demography, health, environment, natural resource management, and uh, security, and how they um, uh, influence each other, and uh, so today's event is a, is a very good example of this, I think. Um, uh, just a couple of notes before I turn things over to, uh, to Tad Davis. Um, this event is being webcast, so when we get to the Q&A, please wait for a microphone to come around to you and let us know who you are so folks watching online uh, know. Um, and also that uh, this is... Um, we're very fortunate to be hosting this event, which is part of um, the Army Environmental Policy Institute's sustainability series. And so we're really grateful that they've um, shared this event with us and co-sponsored it with us and um, given us this excellent opportunity. So I will now turn the floor over to Tad Davis, who will introduce Amory. Uh, Tad Davis is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Army for Environment, Safety, and Occupational Health. Um, and Tad, thanks for your support as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gib. It's really an honor for me to be here uh, with you all today on behalf of the United States Army and the Army Environmental Policy Institute. A uh, great day to be a member of the Army team. We just want to thank Gib uh, up front and the Wilson Center for um, the partnership that is bringing this uh, wonderful event here to all of you today that are in the room, but more importantly to those that are uh, back at the Pentagon and uh, out there in the uh, uh, webosphere. Um, Amory, uh, we're delighted that you could be here with us today uh, because this is a, marks our 31st lecture. We started this uh, almost four years ago, kind of as an idea that you know spawns from many of our uh, time in the world of academia, where you would traditionally come together periodically for a brown bag luncheon uh, in the conference room, you know, bringing in uh, different members of the senior faculty to kind of tee up issues for discussion, and it's kind of evolved over time, you know, to where we are today. But I don't think that uh, we have lost any of that uh, continuing need to question what it is that we're doing to continue to ask the hard questions. And I think it's only fitting uh, that we're here today and that Amory, who's truly been a friend of ours within the DOD and the military, uh, a friend for many reasons, um, first and foremost, because he pushes us, pushes us very hard. He asked a lot of hard questions, uh, which I think is also not a bad thing, uh, but probably most important is he challenges us to think on a recurring basis. And, uh, you know, I've had the privilege of spending time with him here and out in Colorado. And uh, it, every time that we have, you know, these engagements, um, I always walk away um, with many, many more questions, but having felt that I learned tremendously, you know, from him. And uh, while we've learned a lot, I think there's still a lot that we can uh, and should learn, uh, and I'm just delighted that so many of you could be with us here today uh, for uh, this particular lecture. I think he needs no introduction, and like I said, he, uh, Amory has been a tremendous friend of the military, and this effort in terms of winning the oiled end game has been a tremendous uh, eye-opening experience uh, for many of us uh, involved. I did want to uh, recognize a couple of our uh, guests that are with us today. Uh, Rear Admiral Morissette from the United Kingdom, who's here with us down the front row, who's leading um, their efforts uh, across the pond, so to speak, in the energy sustainability uh, arena. We're delighted to have him here with us. And then also joining us today is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, um, Ms. Amanda Dory, who is leading um, the thinking within the building on global climate change. And we're really delighted that she could be here with us today because she, too, is making us think on a whole new level, I, I believe. So without further ado, I want to turn the floor over to Amory, and we're just delighted to have him uh, here with us today. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. After that uh, generous introduction, I can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. Uh, <clears throat> but I'd like to uh, bring a lot of provocative and good news about the strategic energy opportunities before the Department of Defense to get, as we put it in our Defense Science Board, more fight, less fuel, at lower cost and with a safer world. Uh, the Department's energy challenge can be rather simply summarized. Uh, the mission's at risk, and we're paying huge costs in blood and treasure and lost combat capability because of the waste of energy throughout the battle space and because of fixed facilities dependence on a very vulnerable electricity grid. Now, there are ways to turn those handicaps into uh, huge gains in capability. Uh, cost is comparable or lower in capital and uh, much lower, of course, in operation. No compromise. I believe in our last DSB panel we took 143 briefs on uh, military energy efficiency, and not one of them disclosed a trade-off or compromise with combat capability, quite the contrary. Uh, now, I'm going to weave part of my story here around two new strategic vectors uh, that our Defense Science Board panel proposed, which are called endurance and resilience, that can get this done if they make their way into doctrine. But this will depend on uh, command attention at, at all levels and persistently, just like changing any other big idea in the revolution in military affairs. Uh, this interesting comment <coughs> that uh, energy saving technologies <coughs> uh, could do more to solve the most pressing long term challenges facing the department than any other single investment area. This came from the Logistics Management uh, Institute in its vetting of uh, winning the oil endgame. I think it's true, uh, and I hope you will think so too by the time I'm done. Now, winning the oil end game, which, which uh, was just referred to, <clears throat> is a quite detailed uh, study we did for Andy Marshall and Jay Cohen uh, five years ago, nobody's arguing with, written for business and military leaders around competitive strategy business cases for cars, trucks, planes, fuels, and military. You can get it free at oilendgame.com, and it's a detailed roadmap for getting the United States completely off oil by the 2040s, led by business for profit. I think it also applies in the UK and, and elsewhere. I work in about 50 countries, and I can't think of one where it, it wouldn't work, uh, although obviously many details differ. The transition we looked at could look like this, that the uh, use of oil and the imports of oil to the United States I wish we could kill these lights so we could see the screen better. Maybe the, there's a way to do that. No? Well, I'm here, and you're not videoing there, and the lights there are pointing at the screen. Oh, well. Um, <clears throat> but the red lines show oil use and oil imports heading, as usual, towards the northeast corner in the official forecast. And our analysis showed how to turn those downwards first along the green lines by redoubling the efficiency of using oil. We've already doubled it since 75, and we can double it again at an average cost of $12 per saved barrel in year $2,000. Then we could go down more steeply along the blue curves by replacing the remaining half of the oil with a mix that's about three-fifths save natural gas and two-fifths advanced biofuels unrelated to the food system. And because the saved gas is so cheap, that supply side half of the oil solution has an average cost of $18 a barrel. Uh, the costliest marginal bit is still under 26. So if you average 12 and 18, you get 15 as the cost of getting off oil. That's about a fifth what we pay for the stuff, assuming all externalities are worth zero, a conservatively low estimate. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you'll notice that we actually had a steeper drop in oil use and imports once before, the last time we paid attention, 77 to 85. In those eight years, GDP grew 27%, oil use fell 17%, Oil imports fell by half. Imports from the Persian Gulf fell 87%, and they would have been gone in one more year if we'd continued. And in fact, the 
dropped by half in OPEC's exports broke their pricing power for a decade because we customers, especially in America, the Saudi Arabia of mega barrels, uh, we customers had more market power than the supply cartel because we could save oil faster than they could conveniently sell less oil. This is still true, as was again demonstrated last year, when just a, a, a recession-induced, in this case, tipping of the supply-demand balance uh, crashed the oil price by a factor three in a matter of months. Um, <clears throat> the business case brought about by the spread between the $15 average cost of getting off oil and whatever the price is, uh, is so compelling that we found this transition did not actually require any new national energy taxes, subsidies, mandates, or laws. There are some innovative public policy measures we propose that would help, but they could all be done administratively or at a state level. Uh, so, you know, that was practice. This is real. You are here. And now we have much sharper tools than we did the first time round. Um, <clears throat> Now, technologically, the key is transport, which uses 70% of the oil, but we found there's a common recipe for tripling the efficiency of uncompromised but safer cars, trucks, and planes, um, with paybacks of respectively about one year, half a year, and uh, three or four years. Uh, and th and uh, that's just to make them much lighter weight, more slippery in moving through the air or along the road, and with advanced propulsion. Often you also get better performance. For example, this Opel diesel hybrid uh, does 155 miles an hour and 94 miles per U.S. gallon, although not at the same instant. And the thing that will surprise many people is that the ultralighting that doubles the efficiency of these carbon fiber concept cars would, in volume production, not increase their cost at all. It's free. Uh, you'll see why in a minute. Um, and the technology for all of these transport innovations and for very large savings in the buildings and industry that use the other 30% of the oil, the technology keeps improving faster than we use it and faster than the stunning advances in finding and lifting oil. So the uh, value gap between the price of oil and the cost of not using it uh, keeps widening. Now, to see how this works, let's just take a look at your car, which every day uses typically about a hundred times its own weight in primeval swamp goo, uh, a little bit of it which got inefficiently converted to oil. Well, <clears throat> once the oil gets to your tank, about 87 percent of it never reaches the wheels. It's lost in the engine, idling, driveline, and accessories. Of the 13% that does reach the wheels, um, about half of that either heats the tires and road or heats the air that you're pushing aside, but only the last 6% actually accelerates the car and then heats the brakes when you stop. Unfortunately, only a 20th of the mass you're accelerating is you. 19 20ths is the heavy steel car, uh, therefore a 20th of 6%, or about 0.3% of the fuel energy actually moves the driver not very gratifying after 120 odd years of devoted to engineering effort. But the good news is that um, two thirds to three fourths of the energy it takes to move the car is caused by its weight. And every unit of fuel we can save at the wheels saves an additional seven units that we need not waste getting it to the wheels. So there is enormous leverage in making the car radically lighter weight, whether through ultralight steels or light metals uh, or the stiffest and strongest uh, carbon fiber composites. Uh, composites. I, I'm going to have to stick to U.S., I apologize. I'm, I'm bilingual. I lived in England 14 years. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, of course, we use these materials already in military and sporting goods, but at about a thousand times lower volume and higher cost than you would need for series production cars. But I started getting encouraged about bridging that gap when I met Dave Taggart uh, at the Skunk Works who had led the design of an advanced tactical fighter airframe that was 95% carbon, one-third lighter, but two-thirds cheaper, because it was designed on a clean sheet to be made optimally out of carbon, not metal. Of course, <clears throat> it was a bit too weird and activated the immune system of the Joint Strike Fighter community, so he couldn't find a customer. So he quit, and I picked him up one bounce later and asked him to do the same thing for cars in the Skunk Works fashion. And um, what we ended up with working with a British and a German Tier 1 
uh, was this uncompromised mid-size suburban assault vehicle that can take five adults in comfort up to two, two cubic meters of cargo, um, zero to 60 miles an hour in 7.1 seconds, um, 67 miles per U.S. gallon or uh, in, on a, in a, with a gasoline hybrid like a Prius. It's half normal weight, but it's actually safer than, than uh, today's SUVs, if, even if it hits one. Uh, and we found that in mid-volume production, the extra sticker price would be $2,500 because it's a hybrid, but nothing extra because it's ultralight. And the reason for that emerges when you look at how it's made. There are 14 parts in the body, and like an airframe, they're suspended from rings to be very strong and stiff rather than built up from a tub, which is our horse and buggy legacy in the car business. Um, each of these parts can be lifted with one hand and no hoist. In fact, the big part here on the side I can briefly lift with one finger. Uh, each of the parts is made with one low-pressure die set. Now, a steel SUV has about 10 or 20 times this many parts, each with an average of four progressive steel stamping die sets. So we just saved about 99% of the nearly billion-dollar tooling cost. The parts then snap precisely together for bonding, like a kid's toy, uh, <clears throat> but a lot stronger. And therefore, you no longer require the jigs, robots, and welders of the body shop. And if you lay color in the mold, you don't need the paint shop either. Those are the two hardest and costliest parts of making the car. Uh, they went away, and therefore, you need at least two-fifths less capital than the leanest plant in the industry. So between these huge savings in manufacturing cost and the two-thirds smaller powertrain, the ultralighting pays for itself. That is, the higher cost of the materials is offset, and the car costs the same. Um, in case you're wondering about strength, um, this is... Let me see if I can get this going. Oh, phooey. We lost our animation. No? Huh? This is a Formula One-like thing called a Champ Car that just ran into a wall at 180 miles an hour. Catherine Lange is inside. She has nine times the kinetic energy to take the wall at 60 miles an hour because it goes as V squared. So this doesn't look very promising. She's in there somewhere, but there's a happy ending. And the best news is that Catherine Lange has walked out of the medical center under your own power. How are you feeling? Uh, a bit shaken, but I'm okay, as you can see. Oh. Sorry. All my bits are intact, so it's good. It goes to show how strong the cars are. Where where do you have some, some injuries? Oh, I just bang my knee. Car upside down, you, you bang your legs on the, the bulkhead and on the steering column and stuff, so just a bit of bruising, which uh, won't look too attractive in my dress in the Atlantic's banquet tonight. But. Yeah, and by the way, the material her car was made of is about um, half as tough as what we would use now, which is not a thermoset but a thermoplastic. So I brought along my carbon cap today just to illustrate how the technology is moving along. Um, this is a test piece for ballistic helmets now shipping to the military and others. And uh, this piece was made in less than a minute, but it's tougher than titanium. Uh, it's been whacked on with a sledgehammer and not hurt it at all. I can't even see a scuff. Uh, and um, it has, as you can hear, some unusual mechanical properties. We'll pass it around. Um, don't worry about dropping it. <laughs> uh, but um, that illustrates how we have technology now that can make aerospace, aerospace grade uh, advanced composite structures in a process that scaled and matured gives you automotive cost and speed. Um, and that means we just discovered a Saudi Arabia drilling in the Detroit formation. That's how much oil we save if we make our cars and light trucks out of this stuff. Uh, because half the weight and half the fuel use go away, it gets safer because this absorbs 12 times the crash energy of steel uh, per pound. Um, and uh, the car costs the same to make. Now. One interesting example of how the industry is starting to think about this is this concept car that Toyota showed two years ago called the 1X because it has the interior volume of a Prius with half the fuel use and a third the weight. It's a plug-in hybrid with a half-liter engine tucked under the rear seat. Uh, and you might say, well, that's just a, a, a brag. Concept cars don't get to market, except that the previous day, Torre, the world's biggest maker of carbon fiber, 
had announced a big factory to mass-produce carbon fiber car parts for Toyota, a phrase not previously much heard in the industry. Uh, so this was clearly put together a uh, statement of strategic intent, which they later confirmed, and now Nissan and Honda have a similar deal, uh, so the next big automotive leapfrog is off and running. And meanwhile, um, Ford and uh, Nissan and the Chinese industry and now Audi have been starting their own lightweighting revolution, presumably using more conventional materials. Um, now we're busy implementing the oil endgame through what we call institutional acupuncture, which means we figure out where the business logic is congested and not flowing properly. We stick needles in it to get it flowing. Now this works very well and it's as much fun as you can have with clothes on. Um, we, we need to shift what's happening in six sectors uh, and I'd say three or four of them are already at or near their tipping point. Uh, in aviation, Boeing has pretty well flipped the competitive conditions in the airframe sector with the Dreamliner saving a fifth of the fuel at no extra cost and with many advantages to both the maker and the buyer. It's sold out into 2018 and has the fastest order takeoff of any jet in history. Um, but they didn't simply take a half carbon fiber uh, airplane and combine it with better engines and aerodynamics and better uh, actuators and so on to make a an efficiency leapfrog in the platform. They turned it actually into a breakthrough competitive strategy with Project Yellowstone that rolls out those innovations to every airplane they make before Airbus can steer itself out of the ditch. And it would be reasonable to infer that Boeing is probably using some of its cash flow and momentum now to double down on more advanced designs for doubled and tripled efficiency and so on planes in the hope that then Airbus will never catch up. Um, please hold that thought, I'll come back to it in a minute. In Class A trucks, uh, Walmart has saved, as of last year, 38% of its fuel per ton mile and aims to make that 50% by 2015, knowing that the their, their immense demand pull is dragging into the market those doubled efficiency trucks that then everybody will be able to buy and that will save 6% of US oil which is over three times what the Department of Defense uses for everything and then we go on to triple efficiency trucks and make it 9% um, as I will describe uh, the military is emerging has emerged I think as the federal leader in getting this country off oil for its own good reasons uh, more on that later. And there are huge innovations in fuels and finance, uh, but we always knew the toughest, slowest sector to shift would be the light vehicles. But, um, you know, I suggested in winning the oil endgame five years ago that Detroit should try the strategy that Bo Boeing was unveiling in airplanes. And uh, two years later, it was gratified to see Ford Motor Company hire the head of Boeing Commercial Airplanes as its own chief executive. So Alan Mulally has now been in Dearborn with transformational intent for three years. And you'll notice that Ford doesn't look like GM and Chrysler anymore. It didn't go broke, it didn't ask for a bailout, and it's now leading innovation in things like lightweighting and electrification, so it's quite an exciting place. And of course, the workers and dealers who were always cast as the innovation resistors were actually very keen uh, for basic innovation to save their sector from the tsunami of creative destruction about to wash over them, which since has done. And uh, certainly what has happened that we were unable to prevent uh, has opened minds to seemingly unthinkable change, uh, further spurred by new leapfrogs and market entrants and some transformational projects we've been doing in the industry. So this, this competition is at an unprecedented level that is changing the managers or their minds, whichever comes first. Um, <clears throat> now, this brings me then to the military part in this off-oil revolution. Um, the soft underbelly of the department is fuel and fuel logistics. In our last big war, our heavy steel forces floated to victory on a sea of oil, and nearly all the oil that defeated the Axis came from Texas. Well, today we use 16 times more oil per warfighter per day than we did then, and Texas is a net importer of oil. In very round numbers, logistics uses about half the department's people and a third of its budget 
and about 70% of the tons moved when the Army deploys are fuel. Um, now this number is a couple of years old, so it may have changed since, but at least at that time I was told that about half of the casualties in theater were associated with convoys, of course mainly hauling oil. Um, now it isn't, I know, done by divisions, but if you add it up there are divisions worth of people hauling oil about and more divisions worth trying to guard them. Uh, and yet most of the fuel so delivered is wasted because when we required and designed and procured the things that use the fuel, it was assumed that fuel logistics is free and invulnerable. A very, very bad approximation. Uh, this is illustrated by a sort of causal logic. Here's an inefficient five-ton air conditioner trying to cool an uninsulated tent in a hot sandy place. It uses maybe a gallon an hour. So here's 68 barrels of oil on one of the local trucks and that can cool 120 of those tents for 24 hours. Here's a three-mile convoy of such trucks. Now if you were special forces wouldn't you just drool looking at that? You know you kill the truck at each end and pick them off at your leisure. So there's then a lot of this going on. These photos are not all in the same place but you get the idea. As Colonel Nelson says, uh, the best way to defeat an IED is don't be there. We need to breed a Manx force with no tail. And what we're really after, of course, is keeping people comfortable in the tent. So now we've been foaming lots of tents with insulation. What a concept. So we're no longer entirely space cooling by cooling outer space. Um, and I think we could actually make a black box that cold air will come out of using no electricity. Uh, but meanwhile, we can do it much more efficiently than this. But where we're headed with this logic of efficiency and better provision of the service is no gensets, then no convoys, no problem, and turn your tail into trigger pullers as a force multiplier. Now, our adversaries have been figuring out that they can attack not only the will of the people, but also military capacity. And uh, some of us wonder how soon they, they bring that tactic to a theater near you. Um, <clears throat> And the endurance strategic vector I'll be talking about is, of course, just as vital for stability ops as for concept ops, especially now that they have equal priority, because stability ops may need even more persistence and dispersion and affordability for a long time. Um, we found in our first Defense Science Board crack at this and, and reinforced in the second that actually a lot of the fuel users in the battle space are non-combatants. In a typical army unit, um, armored, we found that only the, the number five, um, the uh, Abrams, and the number 10, the Apache, are actually combat platforms. The rest are non-combatants, a number of which actually haul fuel. In a sense, we haven't come very far since the Civil War when half of what our mule teams hauled was their own feed. Uh, <clears throat> and. Uh, you know, isn't it rather an odd way to fight a war when the water heater uses more fuel than the helicopter? Now, the b benefits you get from radical energy efficiency in the battle space are of several kinds. You get a force protector because you have a lot fewer of those vulnerable convoys and forces guarding them. You're a force multiplier because now you can turn convoy guards into uh, shooters. It's a force enabler because of everything it does for all of the attributes you need to deal with asymmetrical and demassed and elusive and remote and irregular adversaries. So I don't much care whether you talk about range or persistence or dwell or the more classical attributes like agility, mobility, maneuver or reliability or autonomy, it seems to me from every perspective this has got to be an operational winner. And it can unlock enormous realignment potential, multi-divisional level when you add it all up, and tens of billions of dollars a year, possibly more. The biggest win is to catalyze leap ahead civilian technology tr uh, transitions because just as military science and technology gave us the internet, the global positioning system, the jet engine and microchip industries, when we start 
valuing saved fuel properly, it's going to drive huge military innovation in light and strong materials, advanced propulsion, aerodynamics, fluid dynamics generally, you name it, that is going to come back to the civilian sector and speed up the tripling of the car, truck, and plane efficiencies and thus get us off oil faster so we don't need to fight over the oil and we can have neg emissions in the Persian Gulf. Mission unnecessary. You can imagine um, many of you are war fighters. That's a really attractive idea. Now, back in odd five, this was the closest we could get, and you'll see there are a few, of, a few numbers missing that I need to fill in. For where the fuel went that was used by the department, nominally it used just under 2% of U.S. Uh, fuel, but uh, actually that may be low because a lot of stuff got outsourced to contractors who count as civilians, so we don't know exactly how much we use anymore. Um, and it's about two-thirds jet fuel. Uh, it is more than half Air Force, and about three-quarters go to air platforms. However, Notice that an unknown fraction of what counts here as Air Force or Navy fuel is actually used to move the Army around. And since we don't do activity-based costing, nobody's keeping track of what that is. Uh, so we don't really know what it takes in fuel to provide the Army's mobility. Um, now, there are some interesting things that pop out when you start to look at the end uses. Um, Aircraft are quite important, of course, naval aviation. Uh, hotel loads are about a third of the non-aviation fuel use afloat for the Navy. A surprise to many is the gensets um, making electricity in forward operating bases and the like are using a third of the Army's wartime fuel. And uh, when we looked at a forward operating base, we found about 95% of that electricity is used for the thing you saw in the picture, space cooling in outer space, uh, air conditioning, uninsulated, or even unoccupied structures. And uh, the Air Force <clears throat> uses about half its fuel for heavy fixed wing uh, transports and tankers, not counting the bombers. And then the fighters are up here. So it's a complex picture. But um, we did dig into it considerably in the More Fight, Less Fuel study, uh, co-chaired by former SecDef Schlesinger and General Carnes, uh, retired. And uh, I want to give you my own views on this, but first the, the official ones. The, the terms of reference were to figure out how to save fuel and what it does, how to deploy non-fuel uh, energy sources, both fixed and mobile, and what's getting in the way. And the key findings were exactly the ones I started with. Um, the uh, risks to the mission and to forces from operational fuel demand, which we then turned into fuel waste, and the vulnerability of the power grid. And then there were institutional findings as well, that the department's not set up to recognize or fix these problems. There are technological solutions, but they're undervalued and generally unbought. And uh, also there are a lot of operational changes to be made. I won't bore you with the recommendations. They get into considerable detail on how to fix these problems. And uh, I hope as the department uh, builds its uh, front bench in energy leadership that uh, these will get implemented even faster. But I want to tell you the rest of the story from my personal perspective. And what I'll say here is entirely consistent with the report and everything briefed to us, but it's in my words, not theirs. I think there is a clear and present danger or crisis in our national and theater energy security, but it's not about oil. It's about electrical vulnerabilities. Uh, <clears throat> the vulnerabilities that nearly brought down the Iraqi grid. We were maybe one transmission line away when the surge started working. Uh, and the bad guys kept knocking down the lines faster than we could put them up. I should add parenthetically, we tried three times to get inherently invulnerable architecture, decentralized distributed systems built into Iraqi reconstruction and the White House vetoed it three times. Um, even though the Iraqi power minister was on board the third time. Maybe we'll get it the fourth time. These vulnerabilities are starting to become 
a serious concern in Afghanistan, and they could take down the operating capability of the department and the entire U.S. economy. More on that later. And there is a gathering storm uh, about oil supply, but not specifically for the department, which has purchasing priority under the Defense Production Act. And it doesn't use all that much oil. Even though it's the world's biggest single buyer of oil, the department uh, could be run on a couple of good-sized platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. It's 0.4 percent of the oil market. We should not worry about whether the department can get oil. Rather, the oil issue is the costly burdens and the weakened combat effectiveness from wasting oil and all the fuel logistics burden that comes with that. But all of these weaknesses, both of the electric and the oil side, can be turned into radical improvements in combat capability at reasonable or often lower upfront cost and thus turn these risks into revolutionary gains in warfighting capability and less need for warfighting because there will be less conflict about oil or induced by oil and all the instabilities that come with it. So to do this, <clears throat> I think, takes two new strategic vectors, and our Defense Science Board panel recommended that, that these be seriously considered. The first is resilience. I'll, I'll take them in the other order, actually. Combining efficient use especially of electricity with diverse dispersed and often renewable supply so that the major supply failures that are now inevitable by design become impossible by design. The endurance vector, and I'll start with this one, uh, does a typically several fold improvement in energy efficiency which then means autonomous or local supply can do a lot more and it therefore yields the attributes that I described earlier, whether in uh, our current kinds of operations or more traditional ones. Now, like the other big ideas that drive the revolution in military affairs, speed, stealth, precision networking, these are important and they take a lot of attention and uh, they have a huge payoff. That's what vectors are for. So I want to walk you through my petting zoo these are publicly usable images uh, briefed to us or that I got from elsewhere um, that show in each case what the efficient platform is, what it does operationally, and how much fuel it saves. So a heavy fixed wing, blended wing body aircraft, we were told, can save about five to nine fold on fuel or across the whole Air Force mission portfolio maybe two to fourfold. Here's a cute one I think we might have stolen from the Russians, I'm not sure, but I'm told it's uh, over 30-fold fuel saving, 97 percent, because it replaces three different aircraft and it has a 50-hour loiter. Uh, there are huge advances in engines and in lightweight structures. Here's an interesting one, a different way of designing a uh, rotary wing craft uh, so it has five or six times the range, triple the uh, speed. It's very quiet. Fuel use goes down five or six fold. So you could jump over someplace like Mogadishu and go way inland all in one hop at 300 knots and get vertical insertion for mounted maneuver. Uh, I think a lot of people would like a capability like that. Uh, just re-engining an Abrams with a modern diesel <laughs> would more than double the range, cut the fuel use three or four fold, and then there are digital diesels emerging that are a lot better than that. Um, actuators, things that produce linear or rotary motion from electricity, we don't think about much, but they have undergone enormous innovation, and you could save hundreds of billets, uh, millions of pounds weight, and so on, just on a carrier with six applications of this instead of hydraulics. Basically, anything you can do now with hydraulics, you can do better with electrics. I've told you about this one already. SecNav Danzig had us look at uh, Princeton, an Aegis cruiser, and we found we could save close to half the, half the hotel load uh, the energy takes other than launch propulsion of weapon systems, CQ vibe, just to look after the people as a retrofit with very good economics and no compromise of combat capability. Of course, you could then <clears throat> drive it with new kinds of propulsors too. Here's one that you can spin underwater at 2,500 RPM with no cavitation. 
You can't do that with a bare cylindrical shaft because the uh, boundary layer pulls the water apart. Mathematically, this doesn't have a boundary layer. It's a Fibonacci spiral out of biomimetic design. Um, we have special forces breaking their legs, parachuting in with 140 pounds of batteries to last for a week or two to run their electronics. And I kept asking, why do their laptops use 50, 60, 70 watts and rising? Well, here's a laptop for every child, actually a very capable machine that uses one and a half to two and a half watts, and it runs on a little solar cell, and if you want a hand crank, uh, it costs a few hundred bucks. Well, same technology is transferable. Here's an example of a zero net energy building. We've done those now from minus 47 to plus 115 Fahrenheit at lower construction cost. Here's a supercomputer, a very capable one uh, that runs with perfect uptime with no cooling in a hot high altitude hallway at Los Alamos. And it has three or four times lower total cost of ownership than the usual cooled variety. We just designed out the inefficiency. This was Dr. Fung and the late Chris Hip. I saved this one for last because it's maybe the most interesting in the reset context where we're about to spend $85 billion on uh, rebuilding things like up armored Humvees. Uh, this was, <clears throat> this is an early photo, I don't have the recent ones that have evolved considerably, of Scott Badenoch's uh, uh, blast bucket ultralight armored tactical vehicle. But it is a to put it conservatively, several fold improvement on the current versions in uh, weight, fuel, uh, uh, acceleration. It is dynamically stable at all speeds, including high speed maneuver. Um, all seven causes of deaths in Humvees have been forensically analyzed and designed out. It has higher lethality, much higher protection. You can penetrate it ballistically. It takes a 50 cal at, it's either 43 or 4500 FPS, which Aberdeen could barely achieve without blowing up the gun. And it is extremely IED resistant because the new version has a kind of faceted cockroach architecture, so there's nothing for the blast wave to grab hold of. <clears throat> and uh, by the way, the cost is comparable or lower as well. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that our panel recommended be rapidly looked into uh, in February odd eight, and I don't, I don't think that's happened, but it should. Um, now, if you were prospecting for winners, uh, clearly to save the most total fuel, you go for aircraft because those use almost three quarters of the fuel. And if you save 35% of what the aircraft use, that would be equivalent to saving the entire fuel use of all land and maritime vehicles and all facilities. But that's actually quite a conservative target because, uh, you know, most of the heavy fixed wing inventory is half century old or more technology and nearly all the vertical lift fleet is 30 to 50 year old technology. It's astonishingly old stuff. Uh, and it is very straightforward, our panel found, to have the fuel use in the heavy fixed wing fleet just by practical and, and properly combined improvements. Um, and then there's a factor five or six improvement in the vertical lift through optimal speed tilt rotor. Now if you want to get the most combat effectiveness gain, you're going to look for fuel efficient ground forces. And if you want the biggest fuel savings uh, all together, it's wise to start your savings downstream near the spear tip because saving a liter at the Army spear tip saves an additional roughly 1.4 liters needed to get it there. Also, if you want to save the most delivery cost and thus have the most realignable support assets, you'll focus your savings on aerially refueled aircraft and on forward deployed ground forces. So depending on what benefits you're looking for, you can prospect in different places. But these are all very worthy opportunities. And of course, we're making progress. Uh, starting in April odd 7, when the department first said we're going to value save fuel uh, <clears throat> at its fully burdened cost delivered. 
to the platform in theater in wartime. There were pilot programs set up to do that. Uh, of course, there have been changes since then. And the JROC started establishing an energy KPP. Implementation was slow, but it's picking up speed. And now the uh, Defense Authorization Act mandates these methodologies, and DOE is starting to organize its energy leadership. And there are some very, very good people here. Thank you. Uh, but now we need to focus on some even deeper issues as we get the new leadership and the new doctrine in place. Um, we need to be quite particular about how we count fully burdened cost of fuel. Um, and uh, thanks to some of our friends here from the Army, we're, uh, we understand a lot of the costs like force protection that we didn't used to. Um, but I don't think we're counting yet in the OSD guidance for fully burdened cost of fuel things like the life cycle uh, cost of the full support pyramids, and it doesn't look like we're counting the rotational multiplier from deployed uh, fielded force in theater to force structure, but we need to, and that's often a big multiplier. In some areas, you will need to adjust for theft and attrition, the fuel that goes over the fence. Uh, and, as I mentioned, there's the lift cost. Uh, now, the cost of getting the fuel to theater is covered. That's part of the DESI direct cost, and they're very, very good at delivering fuel. But we need to get all the, the physical assets to move the fuel around and all the people and everything it takes to support the people into theater and back again, and I don't think we're counting those costs yet. So we still have some refinement to do, and all that's going to do is raise the fully burdened cost of fuel and make us more efficient. We have to know what it really costs, and I think our metal model should be what are the life cycle end-to-end -end costs of ownership that we could avoid throughout the system if we never again needed to deliver that marginal gallon. We also found something most remarkable in our DSB panel, and I must say it was rather shocking because we couldn't find anybody in the building who'd really articulated it before, but it was kind of obvious when you, at least to a novice in military affairs like me, when you back off and squint at it, it, it just jumps at you. What the JSIDS uh, system calls capability is the theoretical performance of the tooth without counting the tail that's needed to produce the capability. <laughs> of course, tail takes money and people and material that detract from tooth. So we suggested <clears throat> that net capability constrained by sustainment should be calculated thus. It is the gross capability or gross performance of a platform or system multiplied by what we called an effectiveness factor, which is the ratio of effect to effort. And you can calculate that as tooth over the sum of tooth and tail. And since they both come out of the same budget, that is tooth is resources minus tail, you could also say by algebra that the effectiveness factor is the difference between resources and tail all divided by resources. Well, you can see mathematically that the effectiveness factor will be zero if you have an infinite tail, and it'll be one if you have a zero tail. As long as the tail is bigger than zero, your net capability will therefore always be less than your gross capability, your theoretical tailless performance. But it seemed to us that DOD consistently confuses these metrics and thus misallocates most of its resources that go into platforms. Uh, that is, we often end up, it seems, buying more tooth that also comes with more tail, but the tail is kind of invisible. It's off in some other category or budget or, or organization. And when you look at the net capability gain resulting, it may be small or zero or negative, but we're not counting because we're only looking at gross capability. And yet it's also obvious from the mathematics that if you dramatically trim the tail, you get revolutionary gains in net capability. And, of course, you free up the people, equipment, and budget for realignment. So I think this is a big um, SECDEF level issue. 
that needs to be thought about carefully, and uh, I hope there are people here who can help do that. I want to um, then move on to the resilience vector. We're used to pictures like these where, you know, there are lots of unhappy campers down here 35 seconds later because somebody didn't trim a branch properly. And here's a, a similar thing where we go from this to this in nine seconds. There are 50 million people in this area that lost 71 gigawatts. Notice, however, all the lights that stayed on, those are islanded systems that could run and did run or somehow were improvised to run without the grid. They just cut loose and they had an adequate supply-demand balance to keep the load served. 98 or 99 percent of our power failures originate in the grid. They are not caused by an inadequacy of generation. And our reflex, whenever one of these things happens, is to build more and bigger power plants and power lines. Surprise, this makes blackouts more frequent and more widespread for the same reason as suppressing forest fires. It, it builds up a huge fuel loading and as soon as one gets away from you, you're cooked. Now, there is some major change taking place in the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and elsewhere in our government now to look at inherently resilient systems, but the policy framework that we've inherited for a half century overwhelmingly favors big and brittle. This is not good for our security. The department needs to lead the change. Um, I wrote all this up, by the way, in 1981 in what is still the definitive N-class study of what's now called critical infrastructure for energy. It's called Brittle Power, Energy Strategy for National Security, forwards by Tom Moore and Jim Woolsey. And of course, the electric grid is also needed to run everything else, even your gasoline pump. It's a very complex, unforgiving system, very vulnerable because of the requirements of synchrony and uh, long lines up in the air and vulnerable transformers and often no spare parts. The stuff isn't even made here anymore. But now there are added cyber vulnerabilities. Um, some of you will be familiar with these. Uh, there's a classified um, Appendix A to our report that I commend to your attention. And uh, basically, these vulnerabilities are about the most ser serious national security threat I can think of right now. I, I'm always a bit surprised when I wake up in the morning and the lights are still on. And there are still people, even in this administration, who don't understand the urgency of this issue. Um, and these vulnerabilities are too inherent in the architecture of the grid to fix. Uh, there are some palliative things we can do, but not enough to protect mission continuity for the department. And that's why it needs its own resilient power supplies. Uh, even though DOD is already the world's leading buyer of renewable energy, it's at least 98% reliant on that brittle grid. So it needs to move pretty aggressively to make the basis power supplies resilient. There are 584 CONUS bases when we did this work. And it turns out from Battelle Northwest Lab that about 90% have good supply options inside the fence or nearby, mostly renewable. Uh, most of their electricity can readily be renewable, so you're not dependent on fuel logistics. Uh, and, of course, they also have big efficiency opportunities. So <clears throat> uh, the, the energy independence of those bases could actually help national grid resilience quite a lot because you would have these nuclei where basic services would still work if the grid were down uh, and could also nucleate black start uh, of the grid. And probably only the department uh, is capable of moving as decisively as this threat warrants. Of course, there's an Oconus potential even more valuable uh, because typically the delivered energy costs are higher. You're often in austere environments or with less uh, well-run grids. Um, but our recommendation uh, was that bases, at least Conus, get off the grid, make their own power inside the fence, preferably from renewables, in islandable netted microgrids. Islandable means they can run with or without the grid outside. And netted microgrids means they 
serve the local load and indeed the surrounding communities where most of the people live. So they could keep working indefinitely. Uh, this turns out to be already department policy for some years, but it was never enforced. Uh, and now a number of bases across the services are starting to do terrific work in this area. Uh, within the Army, I would uh, commend especially the Army Energy Surety Task Force for doing good basic work. Um, if you want to know, by the way, how to design power systems or any systems to be resilient so major failures become impossible by design and the more shock the system gets, the more resilient it gets, there is a well-known architecture to this. This is how I put it in the early 80s. Just let you read it. And this is very much what the micropower revolution is bringing to market right now uh, and what a number of bases are buying. Uh, but we don't even do as simple things and, and many bases as identifying the critical circuits so we can serve them preferentially with limited emergency supplies. And uh, we don't make our supplies islandable. If the grid outside goes down, we may go down too. Um, so we, we have, you know, those diesel generators and often but not always they start and then they run for a few days or whatever until they run out of fuel. That's not enough and it doesn't even serve most of the critical loads. Um, but one of the answers and the one that gives the most bounce per buck is efficient use of electricity. Now back in the late 80s, my colleagues and I looked at the measured cost and performance of about a thousand technologies for saving electricity. And uh, we found that about three quarters of the electricity then used in the U.S. can be saved uh, by retrofitting this stuff at an average cost that in today's dollars is about one cent a kilowatt hour. That's cheaper than running a thermal plant even if building the plant and grid cost nothing. There were similar findings abroad. The utilities think tank said, well, we think it's not a 75% saving, but a 40 to 60% saving, and it doesn't cost one cent, but three cents. It turned out the differences were almost entirely methodological, not substantive. But it doesn't matter. They're all big numbers. And <clears throat> in any case, as EPRI would agree, the savings keep getting bigger and cheaper because the technologies improve faster than we're applying them. Uh, that is, the low-hanging fruit keeps uh, falling off the tree and mushing up around our ankles and spilling in over the tops of our waders, and the innovation tree keeps dumping more fruit on our heads. But there's another kind of innovation I'd like to spend a few minutes on with you, and it's not about the technologies, but about how they are combined through integrative design. So let's go to my house, which doesn't have to look like this to work like this. It's uh, up in the Rockies at 7,100 feet elevation where it can go to minus 47F on occasion. Um, you can get frost any day of the year. You can get 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud. And yet, if you come in out of this, uh, the snowstorm that's probably there right now into this atrium, there you are in the banana jungle where I now have banana crops 29, 30, 31, and 32 ripening nicely. <coughs> and then you realize there's no furnace. <coughs> Why don't I have a furnace? Well, I didn't need one, and it was cheaper up front not to put one in. Huh? Well, if you ask most engineers, in such a cold place, how much insulation should I use? They'll probably say, use just the amount that will pay for itself over the years from the saved heating fuel. This is what's in all the engineering textbooks. But it's methodologically wrong because it leaves out the capital cost of the heating equipment. And it turned out in 1983, I paid 1100 bucks less to build the house with no heating equipment, but putting the money instead into stuff like super windows and super insulation. I then took that saved construction cost plus a little more, about 50 a square foot, and used it to save half the water, 99% of the water heating energy, and 90% of the household electricity. So if I didn't make my electricity with solar, my bill would be about $5 a month for 4,000 square feet. That was all a 10-month payback in 1983. Today's technology, which we've just retrofitted to, but I don't have it measured yet, 
is a lot better than that. Okay, um, here's an ordinary looking tract house in California with the obligatory stupid dark roof. Um, <clears throat> this is in a climate that can go to 115 degrees and yet the house is comfortable with no air conditioner and it's cheaper than normal to build in reasonable volume. It's about a factor 10 savings from normal US construction or a bigger saving from normal military construction. Uh, here's a house in Bangkok, really sticky climate. This gives superior comfort at normal construction cost with a tenth of normal air conditioning energy. So I offer these three examples, which pretty much span the Earth's climate range, to suggest that if we optimize the house as a system, not the insulation or windows or whatever as a component, uh, <clears throat> then we can make big savings cheaper than small savings. Contrary to what we dimly remember from badly caught economics courses, which said there is this law of diminishing returns, and it says the more you save, the more and more steeply the cost of the next unit of savings goes up until it gets too expensive and you have to stop. Well, this turns out not to be true for a lot of important components like most motors, pumps, rooftop chillers, servers, air conditioners, refrigerators that simply have no correlation between efficiency and price. But it is true of insulation. This is how insulation works. But there's another part of the curve. If I keep going and add maybe twice as much insulation as is normally considered cost effective, I suddenly get to the point where I no longer need the furnace, ducts, fans, pipes, pumps, wires, controls, and fuel supply arrangements, so I get my 99% heat saving at a at $1,100 lower capital cost than if I tried to save nothing. And why should we get there the long way around when we can tunnel through the cost barrier directly to that destination? Well, we've done this on a lot of buildings, hundreds of them. There's 20,000 of them in Europe called Passive Houses. If you want to know more about this, by the way, in Buildings, Industry, and Vehicles, how to tunnel through the cost barrier is laid out in my Stanford Engineering School lectures that are free at rmi.org slash Stanford. But you can even get negative cost for some retrofits. For example, consider a big all glass and no windows office tower near Chicago <clears throat> with heat absorbing glass and as usual after 20 years the seals on the edges of the window units are failing so you have to reglaze the whole thing and we found ways to replace it with super windows that are almost perfect in letting in light without heat so we could let in almost six times more light a tenth less unwanted heat cut the heat and noise flow three or four fold slight extra cost add deep daylighting good lights and controls and office equipment and the cooling load on the hottest hour of the year goes down by three quarters, which means instead of renovating the big old HVAC system, we can put in a new one four times smaller and four times more efficient, but for 200,000 bucks less, and that turns out to be enough to pay the extra cost of the windows, the daylighting retrofit, the lighting retrofit, so we end up saving three quarters of the energy at a minus five month payback. In other words, it's slightly cheaper then the regular 20-year renovation you have to do anyway that saves nothing. And the trick is just to time this so it coincides with the reskinning of the facade you need to do anyway. Well, there's all kinds of replacement cycles in facade and equipment and so on. Let's coordinate with those. It's going to take us decades to fix up all our buildings anyway. So if we get the timing right, the economics look terrific. We've actually <clears throat> done a not quite as artfully timed, but still instructive uh, retrofit design with the Empire State Building, and they're now implementing it to save 38% of their energy with a three-year payback, uh, several times the savings they thought would pencil out, by remanufacturing the windows in a little improvised window factory on a vacant floor into super windows, so we were at least three times better in blocking winter heat loss, twice better in blocking summer heat gain, Altogether, we're cutting the cooling loads by a third, so instead of having to close and dig up Fifth Avenue to get at the old chillers and uh, replace and uh, expand them, we can 
fix them, renovate them in place, and reduce them, that saves $7 million that helps pay for everything else. Um, now, of course, this approach applies also everywhere else, not just in buildings, but in vehicles and in factories. Um, one of my favorites is the industrial pumping loop that saved a factor 12 on pumping energy at lower cost just by using fat short straight pipes instead of skinny long crooked pipes. Although we left a factor four on the table, sorry we'll do better next time. Uh, and one of the things you learn from pumping systems, the biggest use of motors, is to start downstream. If I feed 100 units of coal in the power plant, a lot goes away at the plant, more in the grid, there are all these compounding losses and only a tenth of my original fuel energy comes out the pipe as flow. If I now turn this around backwards, those compounding losses turn into compounding savings from right to left, and every unit of flow or friction I save in the pipe saves 10 units of fuel and cost and pollution and global weirding at the power plant. That also makes the motor about two and a half units smaller, so I'm gonna save the most energy and capital by starting downstream, and it's not that hard. How often do we see a critical pump and a helper pump or two helper pumps um, that are drawn like this because it's easy to draw and then they're built like this so all the time the flow goes through two 90 degree bends, that's friction, and usually two or three valves. Why don't we do it this way with no bends and no valves or one valve? Well, we don't normally do it that way, but when my friend Peter Rumsey did that, as a retrofit, he saved three quarters of the pumping energy and eliminated 15 pumps that will never again waste energy and maintenance. If it looks pretty, it probably won't save money or energy. Or look at this layout to bring cooling water back from the cooling tower to the chiller. Peter does it this way. Everything gets better. It's all, all it means is rearranging your mental furniture as a designer and rigorously applying good engineering practice. Uh, so we've applied this kind of thinking in over $30 billion worth of factories lately in 29 sectors, and we're consistently finding about 30 to 60% energy savings on retrofit with two or three year paybacks. In the new stuff, we save more, and it costs less to build. Uh, <clears throat> So we've now been able to tunnel through the cost barrier in all 29 sectors. But of course, we couldn't do this stuff if, if the original designs had been properly done. I'm getting kind of tired of redesigning stuff that wasn't designed right. So we're hatching a plot for the nonviolent overthrow of bad engineering. It's called 10XE, Factor 10 Engineering. And we're looking for terrific case studies with a high brain Velcro. So once the designers read it, compare with the normal disintegrated design practice side by side. They will no longer design the old way, at least without wincing. Um, I'll give you one example. I'm near the end here. Um, a data center going live for EDS in, uh, now HP, in England next week. Actually, I'm not sure which side of the border it is. It's in, it's in uh, Britain, anyway. So you feed 100 units of fuel into the power plant. You're lucky if 30 gets to your meter. So this is looking like the pump diagram. And then you're lucky if half of that actually gets into your server because half your capital cost is turning energy into cooling and uninterruptible power and stuff. And then of the energy that gets to the server, about half of that never reaches the chips because it's lost in lousy power supplies and fans that take heat that shouldn't be there off the motherboard into the room so you can do dumb things with it. And then a lot of your computing assets are simply sitting there humming away using power but not doing anything because of underused computing resources. Now let's magnify this little stalk because it's about to become invisibly small. Next comes bloatware, so a lot of the threads and processes running on your chips probably don't do you any good. And you may even have inefficient business processes after that, so by the time you get to the end of the line, there's practically no value being created. Now, turn this around backwards from right to left. The first thing you would do is de-bloat the software, write terse code elegantly compiled so every compute cycle is a needed and wanted one. Then you would buy servers four times more efficient, which turn out to cost the same. Then you, don't, you no longer need most of the cooling and UPS. 
uh, and there are much better ways to do both. And you could even do on-site fuel cell trijet if you want. But you start to see how this two order of magnitude leverage comes in. This data center is expected to use a quarter the normal amount of electricity but produce four times the computing and it costs 10 or 15 percent less to build. Had they felt able and had the client allowed them to follow all our recommendations, they would have expected to save 95 percent of the electricity and uh, half the capital cost. So I'll end with uh, what's going on in electric supply very briefly. This graph shows the electricity produced worldwide for micropower. That's the brown part is cogeneration in industry and buildings. The colored wedges are uh, renewables other than big hydro, and altogether they produce now a sixth of the world's electricity. Three years ago it was a third of the new electricity, now it's probably over half. And uh, in a dozen industrial countries, not including ours, a sixth to over half of all electricity comes from these more distributed, more resilient systems, not even counting savings. So micropower is winning because of lower costs and lower financial risks. Just the distributed renewables last year, this part, got $100 billion of private investment. Uh, nuclear, as usual, got zero. It's only bought by central planners. The distributed renewables added 40 gigawatts of capacity, nuclear added zero. There's some interesting contrasts emerging here. And I won't um, bore you with that, but there is an interesting environmental point. If you look at the relative cost of different ways of abating, say, coal plant carbon emissions, this is how much carbon you abate per dollar spent on different ways of getting new electrical services delivered. It turns out that at current utility and Wall Street estimates, uh, nuclear will abate about as much carbon per dollar as a new combined cycle gas plant, but a, a lot less than firmed wind or cogen, and enormously less than efficiency, which is typically off the top of the chart. So nuclear does save carbon, but about 2 to 20 times less per dollar, and about 20 to 40 times slower than if you bought efficiency or micropower instead. So if we want to get off coal, there's a bunch of ways to do it. Five-eighths if we get as efficient as the top ten states are now, adjusted for economic mix and climate. More than all of our coal power goes away if we really use electricity in a way that saves money. Building the wind power stuck in the interconnection queue displaces half the coal power. Building all of it that's cost-effective in available sites saves the coal power about at least four times over. Um, the untapped industrial cogen could save about two-fifths of it, not even counting building cogen. Putting photovoltaics on 7% of our structures would save the coal power over twice over. Lots of other renewables. Oh, and by the way, if we want to save a third of the coal power tomorrow, all we need to do is run the coal plants less and the partly idle combined cycle gas plants more. We have plenty of gas to do that with, and the extra cost will be a couple of cents a kilowatt hour which is uh, maybe a tenth or less what we would otherwise pay. If you start integrating efficiency and renewables, as in this jail retrofit, you also get even photovoltaics cost-effective six years ago. Um, because before you put the three acres of PVs on this big roof, you make it a white roof, you make the jail efficient. So on the hot afternoons when the the cells produce the most power, you have the biggest surplus left to sell back to the grid at the best price. So this $9 million project would have penciled out without the $5 million estate subsidies because it had a $15 million benefit and uh, easily beat the hurdle rate. In other words, the bundle of even photovoltaics and efficiency can be very powerful. Well, if anything, I've seen uh, are said here seems too good to be true, I would just invite you to uh, remember Marshall McLuhan's remark, uh, who uh, he, he said that only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries are protected by public incredulity. And thank you for who you are and what you do and for your kind attention.
if I said anything controversial, sir? One of the best online, uh, uh, could you wait for the microphone, please? Thank you. What are the best online web resources to track and uh, review and keep aware of all these things? Well, all of our publications, uh, almost all, we put up for free at rmi.org. There's a solutions journal, there's a newsletter archive, and most importantly, there's a publications library. Um, and I do a lot of review papers that tie together a lot of the stuff with the latest references. There are, of course, many other sources too, but we're the only ones I know that do a lot of integrative design. You can read about 10XE at 10xe.org. Um, and uh, let's see, if you want to know about distributed resources and their economics, go to smallestprofitable.org. That was an economist book of the year seven years ago. And uh, winning the oil endgame is at oilendgame.com. Another useful site is natcap.org. That's where you get natural capitalism, a 10-year-old business book that gives a lot of the operational context for what I've talked about. Okay. Um, I'd like to open up uh, for a few questions. Um, who'd like to get us started? Sir. There in the middle, please. I'm Mark Kodak with the Army Environmental Policy Institute. How does increased energy efficiency also allow us to increase or decrease uh, water use? About a quarter of our electricity is used to pump, uh, heat, cool, or treat water. That's a rough number. Nobody knows exactly, but it's pretty close. So a lot of the things you do to save energy are actually through water savings. Uh, a lot of water is used to cope with several kinds of waste. We use lots of water at power plants uh, and in cooling towers of, of HVAC for cooling buildings that wouldn't get hot in the first place if we designed them properly. Um, there's actually a whole other dimension to your question. I'll, I'll just mention briefly, there are six reasons we normally connect buildings, which use 70% of our electricity, to remote infrastructure. And those are uh, electricity, cooking fuel if that's different, telecoms, potable water, sanitation, and stormwater management. For each of those, there is, it seems now, an equal or better on-site solution. So if you use all six of them, there are no pipes and wires. You don't throw money in a hole in the ground and cover it up. And uh, this would give the developer better cash flow, better siting flexibility, and it appears now from one empirical example, lower upfront cost, as well as much lower cost to society. So a lot of what we're now doing with stupid sanitation systems and so on is probably not necessary. Of course, the biggest water user by far is agriculture, and uh, that gets us into natural systems agriculture, which is a whole other conversation. But uh, the things that are designed to grow here already have the right amount of water. We don't need to add more. Um, right there, please. Um, so I work on transportation issues predominantly, and I guess I need to reread winning the oil endgame because um, I guess I, my question is about propulsion, because you talked about that's part of the three-tier ultra lighting, ultra low drag, and propulsion. And you know, I th we, there's been studies that have done that, that we're not going to need an elect more electric capacity if electric plugins penetrate the market, um, but that if they actually about 15 or 20 percent. But if we start going to our entire transportation system over electricity, that we might. Be needing to build more plants, and I guess I'm wondering if. Uh, do, you, do you mean like heavy road transport as well? All all transport, including and including public transportation. So I guess I'm, what I'm wondering is if. Uh, well, do you mean just light? You see, if if, if if getting off of oil means the entire off of all oil, and what do you? I guess I'm wondering what do you see as the primary, even in a highly efficient scenario, what you see as the primary propulsion system. For transport, for transport. Well, we have a lot of options. The, the automotive or the light vehicle part of it looks like this. If you are using now a certain amount of oil per mile and you get a good hybrid and drive it properly, you save about half of that. 
If you make it ultralight and slippery, which we should have done first, you save half of what's left. Now you're at a quarter of what you started with. If you run it on E85 sustainably grown, you save three quarters of what's left. Now you're at 6% of where you started. If you make it a, a good plug-in hybrid, <clears throat> you'll save at least half of what's left. Now you're at 3%. If you want to get rid of the 3% and, for that matter, the biofuel, you could go to uh, battery or fuel cell vehicles, both of which actually make sense and make money if and only if the vehicle is properly efficient in the first place. Our Bright Automotive spinoff, brightautomotive.com, has a plug-in hybrid one-ton uh, fleet van, five cubic meters, extremely efficient, uh, and does not require subsidy, unlike other plug-in hybrids, to make a good business case to the buyer because it's so light and slippery, most of the batteries go away. The way to make batteries cheap is don't need many of them. Design the car right in the first place. Heavy trucks are a more complex issue. I, had, I was not thinking of electrifying those. Uh, there, there are some scenarios in which fuel cells could make sense. Um, but uh, I think those are a very good candidate for sustainably grown biofuel, which does not actually need any cropland because the demand is, is so small by the time you do the efficiency. Four million barrels a day of biofuel will run the whole transport system. Um, and you can do that on conservation reserve land and with waste streams. Uh, the conservation reserve land, you would use deep-rooted perennial polyculture, most likely two or three meter roots that will hold the soil a lot better than what they're planted to right now, which is shallow-rooted annuals. Um, aviation will be, I think, the last use of fossil fuel, but there are some very nice recent technologies for converting alcohols and other biofuels into good aviation fuel. Of course, there's the Navy's Green Hornet announcement by SECDAV the other day. And actually, uh, cryoplanes running on liquid hydrogen have quite good energetics and economics if properly designed, and they're safer than kerosene. Uh, this has been well demonstrated by several airframe makers. Um, if, you, uh, if you go to, say, a blended wing body cryoplane um, running a superconducting, high temperature superconductor motor as you gasify the hydrogen and feeding that into fuel cells with unducted fans you're probably at a factor six or seven airplane. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, there's a whole frontier there that's going to take decades to uh, implement, but uh, there is life after uh, hydrocarbons, even in the aviation business. Okay, I think unfortunately we're out of time for questions. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Amory very much for his presentation, and thank you all for coming, and thank you to the AEPI and to Tad Davis, and Tad has a a quick presentation. Thanks very much. Yeah, go ahead. I'd just like to uh, add to uh, what Gib just said. First and foremost, to thank him uh, for his continued leadership here at Wilson and to thank our colleagues here at Wilson for co-hosting today's event. And we hope that this will you know, be part of a, a partnership that will continue, uh, maybe not monthly, but down the road um, as time goes on. Uh, but first and foremost, I'd like to thank Amory for being with us and, as I said up front, for his efforts to continue, uh, you know, to force us to think. Uh, we do think a little bit over there in the Pentagon, believe it or not, uh, but to continue to challenge us and I think to continue to, you know, uh, make us leaders because I think that, as he said throughout his presentation, there's a lot of goodness that comes out of what we're doing within DOD and in many respects, we can, in fact, uh, you know, be leaders in many of the fields um, that he shared with us today. And um, so we'll continue to do the best we can. We'll continue to dialogue with you, and we'll continue to um, call on you from time to time to continue to engage the senior leadership within DOD because we think that, that although the message is getting through, it, it doesn't hurt to be heard uh, occasionally from time to time for that reinforcement. So we do thank you. Uh, once again, for your friendship and for your uh, words today. And we'd like to present you with a small token of our appreciation, a certificate of 
of appreciation and a picture of, of uh, that fond five-sided building across the river. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thanks very much. Very good. We also have one of our, one of our time-honored traditions, Coins for Excellence, and uh, we'd like to present that to Amory as well. And uh, the unique benefit of this, which doesn't go with many of the other many awards that he has received over the years, is the fact that that coin, if presented at the right time and place, is good uh, for the cold beverage of his choice. Uh, <laughs> location to be determined. But thanks once again, ladies and gentlemen. We look forward to uh, seeing you at one of our future lectures. For those that would be interested in, in getting involved in our AEPI series, Natalie uh, Jones, who's here with us today, she'll raise her hand. Uh, you can see her and give her your contact information. But thanks once again for being with us. Have a great day.